Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, th thank you for joining us. We're really excited to begin our first PPCR lecture, PPCR talk with our invited speaker, who is Gabriela Rosa. Gabriela was a 2018 PPCR alumni. Um, she, she was one of the best students in, her, in the program that year. She won a scholar award, and she's a fertility specialist who have helped more than, uh, I believe, 100,000 families, right, Gabriela, around the world. And he, she also has many books um, 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 with this target, helping people around the world on how to improve these chances to actually uh, have a family. She's also right now a second year student in the MPH program at Harvard Medical School. And we're really honored to have you, Gabriela. So please go ahead and welcome. And thank you so much for, for approving to, to give this the first PPCR talk of the year. We're really honored to have you today. So welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. And what a pleasure. It's an absolute delight. It's lovely to be able to be here and connecting with all of you. And um, what I'll do is I have got a very simple, I've got a very simple presentation uh, for today. And mostly what I really want is to be able to answer your questions and things that you would like to be able to know about, you know, where to from here, so to speak, in terms of your own journey. So I will be more than happy to answer any questions throughout the session and, you know, as we go along. There are, I think, you know, there are many things that happen in life that we often don't really understand when we are going through it. And it takes us a little bit of time to be able to really kind of figure out what they mean. And if there is really one thing I, I, I really thought about when Alma um, asked me to present this conversation or to present this first talk, I really thought about, you know, what it is that I really wanted to impart and that I really wanted to leave you with on your own journey towards whatever it is that you want to accomplish and what you want to achieve. And there was only one thing that came to mind. And this is probably the most important part of this entire conversation. And I call it a conversation because it's not a lecture. And I would love to answer your questions, as I said. So feel free to you know, post anything on the chat or anything else that you want. But Ralph Waldo Emerson, for those of you who don't know, he's an American essayist. He's a Harvard University uh, graduate as well, as many of you will be. And he said he wrote this passage that has forever changed my life. And it says, there is nothing capricious in nature and the implanting of a desire indicates that its gratification is in the constitution of the creature who feels it. And in a very summarized version, what that means is that you would not have the desire unless you were capable of its achievement. And that applies to anything that you want to do in life. And I truly believe that if you actually take that, as I did very early on in my life and in my career, and you paste it onto your wall <laughs> and you look at it every single day, you will start to realize that things that really truly call to you, call to your soul, they're not just kind of mere whims. They're not, you know, things that you kind of like go, oh yeah, that's okay. I can I can let that go. I can take it or leave it. Um, oh, I think that we have Leah. Great. Thank you, Alma. Um, they're not whims of, you know, capriciousness. They are really things that often we choose not to focus on because either we think the cost will be too high and I'm not even talking about the financial cost here you know everything in life has a cost uh, whether it is doing something that you want and realizing a dream or not there is a cost to all of those actions or inactions and the truth of it is that when you realize that the things that really come to you and come to you repeatedly and that you truly identify with and that you connect with are things that you are meant to do in your lifetime, things become so much easier. And that really has been my experience, you know, throughout life and throughout everything that I have done to get to this point. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction and let me give you a little bit of insight as to some of the things that I have done and where I'm at right now. And then, of course, as I said before, more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. So as Alma said, I was very, very privileged 
I don't even know the word to use, um, but I received a scholar award um, for, from PPCR and it was a, a really great honor. It was, has been something that has really taught me a lot about, you know, PPCR has really changed my career in many ways. And I'll describe more about how that has been the case as we go along. On a professional level, I have been a clinician since 2001. And I think that it, when I actually decided to join PPCR, which was in 2018, I really felt like, okay, there is more that I want to do. You know, I had by that stage achieved every, for intents, all intents and purposes, every goal that I had ever set, probably in a bit more. And I didn't really quite realize at the time that not only there was more that I wanted to achieve, but there was more that I didn't even realize that I wanted. And I remember having set this little goal, you know, when I started my, my running this program called the Fertility Challenge. That's a program that we have now run for the last 10 years. We have now helped nearly 140,000 couples in more than 110 countries through. And when I actually set the goal to do that, it was just like this little thing that I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to maybe help a thousand people, you know, in other places around the world? I, as you can probably tell, I have lived in Australia for many, many years. So my clinic is actually, the headquarters are based in Sydney, Australia, but we really literally do treat patients in every continent other than Antarctica. So it's quite, um, you know, it's quite funny to re reminisce and think back on how this whole thing started. And it literally was me in a physical practice, seeing patients one-on-one -on -one and thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have a greater reach? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to help more people around the world? And, you know, I then decided that I would put together this little online program for this purpose. And it really was like a little thing. It, it, you know, the first couple of maybe two, three that I ran, it was, um, we had, you know, I think the first one we had a thousand people and I thought, oh my God, I hit that goal of helping a thousand people way before um, I actually even had thoughts. So then I decided that, okay, well, maybe I, I need to, re, you know, set a bigger goal. And I decided that 10,000 was the number, you know, that in 10 years, if I had, being able to help 10 because at the time we were running one a year maybe two um if i can help 10,000 people that will just be amazing um so then i think that we hit 10,000 gosh i think probably year three year two or three and from that point i realized that okay maybe this is these goals are, are just a little bit too small you know that maybe there is more maybe there are things more things that i can do with this and that's really how it unfolded and i think that the point that i make in terms of this is that sometimes you know the things that you can see you know the mountains that you can see as you are standing wherever it is that you stand are the first things that you can see. But when you actually start to climb a little bit more, you start to have a different overview, a different panorama, so to speak, and a different outlook of where and what else is possible. And so from that perspective, I think that it's important to remember that your starting point is really just the beginning and that there is so much more that you can actually do and you can achieve as a result of that. And, you know, the Fertility Breakthrough Program has now become, it's a flagship program that we run in the clinic for couples who typically have been trying to conceive for more than two years without success and generally have undergone many other standard therapies without essentially having the result that they want. And as a result of going through PPCR, I realized that, okay, I really need to get some, you know, quantifying information about our, st our statistics, our numbers, what are the types of couples that you know we we can help what are the demographics of these people and really getting that granular clarity and that's that process started uh, when i started ppcr i realized that okay that we need to really get a whole lot more information so we then realized that the method that we are running in the practice has a close to 80 percent live birth rate for the patients who actually undergo the treatment and that gave me a lot of insight in terms of, okay, well, if it's that helpful, because for those of you who know reproductive medicine, the numbers in reproductive medicine are that great. And especially given the fact that we're treating people who have already failed through many standard therapy treatments, 
um, it's it's pretty much it's it's quite incredible that that's possible. And so hence why once I did PPCR, I realized, OK, I need to do more. I need to actually be able to disentangle all of this information in a whole in, in a much more cohesive way, in a very scientific fashion so that we can start to introduce these pieces to standard therapy, because clearly it's working, it works, and, and there is an incredible value that people can gain from it. And so this is essentially how, you know, this journey has unfolded, so to speak. But I have a question for you guys, because I think that, and I'd love for you to answer in the chat. I want you to kind of, you know, have a look at the story that I've told you up until now, and the places and the times where perhaps, you know, I have not felt certain uh, throughout this entire journey. And I'll be honest about that. You know, it hasn't been a, a day in the process that I have gone, yes, this is what I'm going to do and this is how. It really has been a matter of, okay, I have this feeling that this is something that I, I would like to follow, pursue further and follow through with. And, um, and I might just take the next step towards it. And here's what I want to know. I want to know, do you know what I'm talking about? I want you to have a look and examine your timeline, your life, and I want you to actually recall a time within the points in your career where you weren't exactly certain, but you had that feeling, that sense, you know, that I'm talking about, and you actually decided that you would take the next step, whatever that next step was. And I want to know from you, how did it turn out? You know, let me know in the chat. As I go and I talk a little bit more and I talk through it, I want to know, do you know what I'm talking about? Because being able to recognize those points is almost more important than actually having them, right? Because if you can't actually relate what I'm talking about to your experience, you're not going to get very much out of this. And I really want you to be able to actually have certain share, at least on one thing that you know your life. Right. So pop it into the chat if you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not quite sure, maybe we can have a different discussion around it. Just to continue a little bit more in terms of the journey. So I've now published, I'm working on my fifth. So these are four books that I've published throughout my career. The, these first three were before, I, I actually like to, to call them before PPCR. So this is, you know, before, <laughs> before I actually knew very much in terms of very rigorous scientific um, basis of, you know, lots of things, but, you know, they're, they're still very good information. They were great information for the patients who actually utilize them. And then in 2019, I actually published Fertility Breakthrough, and that was a compilation. In fact, it's still, it still is a compilation and a summary, so to speak, of pretty much all of the things that I had learned in the you know, previous 19 years in doing this work. And what it actually um, entails is a very, it's a manuscript that has, it's very scientifically validated. You know, it, by this point, I knew so much more about, you know, reading research and analyzing research and being able to get clarity, you know, on validity and, you know, all of these topics and conversations that we talk about it, throughout PPCR. And so it really helped me a lot to be able to translate the scientific research. And I think that, you know, through PPCR, one of the things that we learn the most and that we learn so well is the importance of translational medicine, because ultimately, it's one thing if you go and conduct the trial or conduct the meta-analysis or do things that are going to answer scientific questions and answer them well. But it's another thing, and we know that 17-year you know, period that it can take to go from running a trial to actually translating it and making it part of clinical practice. And we all want to make a difference in those terms. And you know, what I realised is that Wherever you stand, you can begin to make a difference in whatever area you choose. And this is really what this book is really what that was about, is that there was so much evidence already from various prestigious universities, including the Department of Nutrition at Harvard, that does immense amounts of research in terms of a lot of the topics that I teach my patients about. And I thought, you know, these are great and they are all in these scientific journals, but people need to actually be able to use them. And so with that in mind, I thought, okay, 
this is really what I want to do next. And this book has transformed so many aspects of my work and the way that I work and has been able to put a very, um, a very authoritative stamp on the conversations that I'm able to have with patients. In fact, if you guys want a copy of the book, all you need to do, just contact me somehow and I'll, I'll give you some ways of contacting me and uh, more than happy to send anyone who's interested a copy of the book. But that really has made a huge difference. And that has happened as a result of being able to read and translate scientific research, which, ha which has happened as a result of PPCR. And I'm just looking on the chat now because I am loving uh, what you guys are writing here. And it's so great, you know, to see how you have this understanding of what it is that I'm talking about. You know, PPCR is a huge next step and it's a wonderful, wonderful next step because it really does give so much clarity along the way. And for me personally, it has really helped me to, to understand where my interests would take me next, which I will talk about in a moment as well. But that is so cool. Oh my God, you guys matching, yay. Oh, residencies and all sorts of great things. I am so proud of all of you. This is so great. And you know what? I think that a big thing here is, is that whole idea of going for it. You know, sometimes it's like it, we, we are all afraid at one point or another in our lives, we are afraid. It's, it's normal, especially when we feel like there is so much that we could lose. But really the reality is that there is very little that you can lose when you go for something that you're passionate about and that you're willing to invest your time, your focus, your energy into. And that is the coolest thing is that you can't lose. You can only learn. And for me, that is one of the greatest assurances. You know, if there is one belief that I choose to have in my life is that the universe conspires in my favor. So I know that whatever is going to happen is going to be for my own benefit. And I think that examining those beliefs that we hold is such an important part of any journey, whether it's career, whether it's a relationship, whether it's, you know, life in general. So I think that all of these things tie in together very well. So if you guys want to get in touch with me and reach out, just maybe screenshot this and you will find me wherever it is that you need to find me. And, um, and basically the book you can request at any time. But here's what I really wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an insight about, because even though this says the journey to parenthood, the reality is that career journeys are very, very similar to this, right? And I think that this is one of the things that we need to understand and that we need to come to terms with because it's so easy when you are a driven person, when you are a, a type personality or something like it, right, that we want to get there. We want the outcome. We want the, you know, the ultimate result of what it is that we're working towards. And the truth that we probably have all realized by now in the stage of life that we are all in, is that it doesn't quite happen like that, right? It's that a little bit of background. Maybe you can make sure that everyone's muted. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, it doesn't quite happen like that. You know, like one of the things that often we we forget along the journey is that everything takes time. That also when we arrive at one place, that place might lead us to a different outcome, to a different place, a different choice, a different result that we didn't foresee when we were first starting on that journey. So I think that having a little bit of that flexibility is really important, you know, holding on to your outcome as a way of having the ability to keep focus, you know, is a great thing. But also having the courage to check in with yourself from time to time and ask, am I still committed to the path that I've set? Or has that changed in some way? Do I need to reassess what it is that I'm doing and how I'm doing it? You know, there are projects in life that I think we all, like for example, you know, when I decided to go on to the MPH, I absolutely knew that no matter what happened, I would finish that. What that would look like in terms of my business or in terms of how things were going to actually pan out, I don't know. And what has been most interesting is that despite the fact that I work with fertility and I'm a fertility specialist, one of the things that I've identified as a result of doing the work that I do as a result of doing the MPH 
and as a result of opening up my horizons to so many other possibilities is that we've realized internally in our clinic that we have a major issue that we need to solve for our patients. And at the moment, the biggest issue that we're needing to solve, solve is one of female sexual satisfaction. You know, we've identified that a lot of our patients, and this happens, you know, for people who are trying to conceive and, and who have had failed attempts for many, many years, they ultimately don't actually want to have sex. Now, if you want to have a baby and you don't want to have sex, it's a problem right it's a real problem and so we've identified that more and more in our conversations this is something that's coming up and so as a result of that going through my my master's we have realized and there were courses that I could take you know sexuality and public health and you know other other different courses that were related to all of these experiences it was definitely not something that I had in my mind to really talk about or, or, or really do that much because I didn't quite correlate and I didn't really have the understanding of how much that actually impacted the result that we were trying to create, as obvious as it may sound. But we realized that actually it does have a, a, a big impact and it's almost like it feels like this detour, you know, as you're going through a journey and you think, oh my God, now I'm going backwards because now I don't really know what it is that I want to do or how I want to actually apply this information. But what I'm trying to get at is what I've said before is that these interests unfold and the problems that you're trying to solve may change over time. But as long as you are committed to the exploration of those paths, you will get to where it is ultimately that you want to be. And that is such an important thing to remember, because if we think that, oh, my God, I have to hurry up and I have to get there and, and it's about completing this residency and then, you know, everything in life is going to be perfect. Take it from me. <laughs> I started a little bit before <laughs> you probably and uh, I can tell you that no there is no such thing and no such point in life that it's just all going to be perfect right do you guys know what I'm talking about right there's this kind of ebb and flow and constant adjustment that we all have to go through but the more that you learn through it the more that you are willing to look at things and face things for what they are the easier it becomes not to have to judge yourself for whatever feelings and emotions you have along the way. And I think that is such a critical point of understanding because a lot of suffering along career paths, along the journey of life happens because we have this need to judge and label ourselves. And so one of the things that I would absolutely recommend, you know, and Anna has said if some imperfections are lessons that we need to be able to learn and, and take for sure. And often it's about opening us up for what's next, you know, and I think that the more that we kind of connect with that, the better the path becomes, because then we are not judging the path for what the path is. We're just saying, okay, well, what can I learn from this? Uh, what can I learn from here? And each step, along the PPCR journey and along the journey of whatever comes next for you is going to be that process. And remembering that is the tricky part. You know, remembering that, especially when things are not exactly easy, when you're sleep deprived, when things aren't going the way that you would like them to go, that is where the growth comes from. And that is certainly where things actually become a whole lot easier. So in terms of this path, um, the path has been a long one. <laughs> this was me at the end. This was the last moment of the last class in the last summer of 2020, as you all can imagine. So I'm doing um, at the MPH, the Master's in Public Health, Clinical Effectiveness, summer only, okay? Which typically means that you go to Boston and you stay there for eight weeks each year and you do your classes and you do your things and, you know, then life happens in between that online and whatever else. Um, not exactly what happened this year. <laughs> this year, uh, or actually I should say last year, as we probably know, there was something called a pandemic that we were affected by and everything shut down in the world, including traveling, including being able to go anywhere and, or, and do very much, you know? And so what ended up happening was that here I was stuck in Australia doing summer school online for six weeks. So it was kind of like night shift, right? For six weeks. Now, that would have been all well and good if I was in my 20s and, you know, didn't have a company to run, my own kind of personal life to run, two kids to run, 
and you know a household to manage and everything else so it was um it was interesting let's put it that way so for six weeks i was kind of like living in opposite kind of time zones from my family and uh and it was an intense time it was really an intense time there were many things that i needed to prioritize and prioritize differently and at the time it almost felt like it would never end you know that feeling that you feel that this suffering is never going to end well, it did. And Alma said, I think that she said that I was in my second year. I'm actually in my third year. So I graduate this year, which is very exciting. It's going to be very sad in one way because I didn't get to spend my three summers in Boston. In fact, I only got to spend my first summer in Boston, but that's okay because at least I'll be graduating. And one thing is for sure, I was talking to Alma in, in before this class and we were saying how, you know, I just hope that by then, because in Australia right now, we have border closures. We cannot go out of the country or come back into the country or come into the country if you're not an Australian um, citizen. And so all I'm hoping is that May 2022, I'll be able to actually go and walk for my graduation. So that's the that's the prayer. Um, but yeah, so anyway, in terms of how it all unfolds and where it's unfolding from here, um, I think that one of the biggest things that is coming up is what we've got planned next. Um, this is one of the <laughs> This is one of the reminders that I had to keep reminding myself about. We must all suffer from two pains, one, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And I felt like, you know, it's best that we actually have the pain of discipline taking these classes overnight than actually not doing it at all. So it was it was an interesting time, but it, it it's over, thank God. And hopefully this year will be very different. So in terms of the future, the future unfolds in the ways that it does. And I alluded to this before, you know, that how it started is certainly not how it's going. And I'm sure it's not how it's going to end. In the beginning of this talk, I began talking about some of the goals that I had set, you know, for, for myself and certainly for the business in being able to help people in different countries and you know numbers of people and so on and so forth. Um, 10 years down the track, I could have not have envisioned that we would have had the reach that we have had up until now. And that just brought me some very stark realizations. We, I set up a telemedicine practice, which obviously this is what this is. Um, in 2003, we began doing telemedicine. So in 2001, I actually started practicing as a fertility specialist. In 2003, I started seeing some couples via tele, you know, telemedicine. In 2013, it went solely telemedicine. So basically what happened in 2020 where doctors couldn't have consultations with patients and you know, had to all of a sudden learn how to use Zoom, we had already been doing that for seven years, okay? And so for us, nothing actually changed. Nothing changed in the business. But many, many things have changed because all of the goals that I had set for what I wanted to achieve in my career happened by 2018. And so then I was left with a situation of, okay, well, what's next? And the truth is that I don't even yet know what's next. But one thing that I, you know, kind of remembered recently was Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote the book, uh, Eat, Love, Pray. She wrote the book, Eat, Love, Pray. And, um, and she wrote another book called Big Magic. And in Big Magic, she talks about the time where after the massive hit that Eat, Love, Pray was, and it became a movie and everything else, she kind of found herself with a bit of writer's block. And she didn't really kind of know what she wanted to write about next or what she really kind of really wanted to, what conversations she wanted to have. And that concept that I've described before of getting a little bit of insight from your interests is essentially what has come to the fore for me now in terms of this, because sometimes you don't know exactly what's going to happen. If we had the magical crystal ball, wouldn't it be amazing? But we don't. So we need to kind of like almost feel our way. And so at the moment, what I'm doing is we're working on uh, the, the practicum project, which I'm delivering it in October, which is the retrospective analysis of our patient cases in the clinic. It has been an immense, um, amazing experience. I'm hiring a statistician for the clinic to be able to actually work on a whole lot of other projects. So that's also been very exciting because that's going to enable us to do so much more. We're working on an IRB for a mixed methods design study that's going to be the clinical, the um, sexual satisfaction for infertile women. 
um, trial. It's going to be mixed methods in that it's going to have a qualitative aspect where we're going to be doing interviews that's going to then inform the intervention that's going to be utilised for the clinical trial. So that's all happening next year. I've already assembled an amazing team. I've got a couple of my professors who, you know, were delighted to be, I invited them and they were delighted to be on board with it. And so it has been, you know, kind of piecing the steps and, and looking at, okay, what, what's next? And how is this going to unfold? And sometimes it's just out of these little conversations, you know, it's kind of like these little interests and these little conversations that lead us to places that we didn't ever expect that we would be. So that's essentially what's going on at the moment. I'm also working on my fifth book, which is going to be about diet and fertility. I was able to, whilst doing my, my MPH, to get into the nutrition con concentration at Harvard with the nutritional department, the, the Department of Nutrition, which is an amazing, amazing place for research on nutritional epidemiology. Um, some of the professors in that department are incredible people, and Dr. Walter Willett is just, you know, if you guys Google him, you will know that it's pretty amazing to be learning from someone like that as well. So it's been really such a um, an enriching experience that I would have never had in any other way. And I remember the very first time that I thought, wow, wouldn't it be nice if I graduated from Harvard was actually when I was receiving my first degree over here <laughs> in 2001. I remember my name being called and I had also won the, the Student of the Year Award. And I remember as I was going up to get my, my certificate and my award thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice if this was me graduating from Harvard? And I literally had forgotten that completely until I got an email from a friend of mine who, when I was asking about doing, you know, a PhD, she sent me the link for PPCR. And when I saw it, I was like, yep, this is it. <laughs> so sometimes look at the signs. So with that, I want you to just realise one thing, and that is that you are infinitely braver than you believe and stronger than you seem, smarter than you think and loved more than you know. And that is Winnie the Pooh because, you know, how else could we finish this talk? <laughs> so, guys, thank you so much for your time, for your attention. More than happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I just know that you're going to be brilliant at whatever it is that you choose. Because remember, it's gratification is in the constitution of the creature who feels it. So that is that. Let me know your questions. Thank you, Gabriela. Amazing. Thank you for your inspiring talk. Please, guys, don't be shy. And uh, be, uh, be, uh, you can open your mic so you can add your questions here in the chat. You can ask about anything, PPCR or, or MPH application, or, or what about the publication, how to apply your knowledge to what you would like to develop um, in your own field, in your own countries, and institutions whatever um remember that this is not a lecture it's more a conversation with gabriella so you can get Absolutely. all her and the inputs and um and doing the working with all of us together so please just not all at the same time because you guys overwhelm me with all your questions if you're you know doing it all together so maybe one at a time would be ideal <laughs> I don't see any questions. Uh, I received one pri privately, actually, and they want to ask you, uh, what was the most challenging thing when applying to Harvard for the MPH? Oh, such a good question. For me personally, the most challenging thing was the GRE. It really was. The GRE was um, not easy because I had, by the time I had actually needed to study for it, I was probably more than 20 years out of high school, okay? So I actually had to study. You know, Felipe, I talked to Felipe, and Felipe goes, oh, you've got to do this GRE thing, you know, but it's easy, you just get the book, and, you know, you'll be able to just, like, study for it in a month. I'm like, okay, Felipe, you are clearly a genius. Wasn't as easy for me, right? I needed to actually get a tutor, remind myself of how it is that you do those mathematical calculations, Again, you know, so it, that for me was the hardest thing. And, you know, look, you do need to have a great letter of intent, 
right? You need to be able to articulate what it is that you want to do and why. The, the you know, when when they, the panel, when they're looking at your, your application, because I didn't actually get in the first time, I actually applied for the MPH in epidemiology to begin with because that was the online. And I didn't get in for that because my GRE result wasn't as good as it could have been. And so what ended up happening was that, and I actually went and applied for the PCE, the Program in Clinical Effectiveness, and I did that and I spoke to the registrar, to the person who basically is in charge of, you know, reviewing applications and everything else. And I asked, I said, listen, what is it that I didn't do that I needed to do to be able to get in? And she goes, well, look, actually, your application was really strong. It was really just the GRE. And the reason that they said to me that that was an issue was because what they're most afraid of is that people are not actually going to complete the program that quantitatively they're not going to be strong enough to be able to actually complete the program. So I took that on board and I went, okay, well, you know what? Let's just ace biostatistics because that would really be helpful. And that's exactly what I did. So I have to say, and this is not a brag, but you know, it's, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, in my entire transcript, I have one B. <laughs> and everything else is an A because I just went, you know what? I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this the absolute best of my ability. So as long as you are committed to doing what it takes, it's really not that hard to be able to get in. You just need to actually do the steps, you know, you, and, and it, is a, it is a process. They want people, the, the acceptance rate at Harvard, I think it's, a, it's 4%. So they get 100 applications for, you know, four places. So imagine, they are going to be selective, but as long as you can articulate what it is that you want to do with that qualification and you have a good plan you can't just like you know get in there and go oh i just want to get a degree well they're going to say go get a degree somewhere else <laughs> okay <laughs> like you actually have to be able to articulate a good plan so that's the number one thing the second is being able to actually demonstrate and they want to see okay how is it that you can demonstrate that you can actually do this thing that you're saying you're going to do Right? And that, and your passion has to shine through because that's really ultimately at the end of the day, how they're going to actually make a selection, okay? So I think, does that answer the question, Alma? Was there any other parts to that? Yeah, um, okay, great. Yeah. Now, but, but we have more in the chat now. Uh, for example, Leticia yeah, is asking- I've got it, yeah. Oh, you okay. Is it possible to do, yeah, I can see the chat. Um, is it possible to do an MPH during residency or fellowship? Look, I actually have a couple of people that I know who have done it and who are doing it. In fact, a whole lot of my friends who are, you know, doctors in different places around the world are in that situation, right? So yes, it is possible. There's a cost to everything. And it's not financial, even though there is a financial cost, right? In addition to it. But there is a cost to everything. It's, it depends on, you know, look, the reality is, is it possible to do anything that you want to do? Yes, but you're going to have to let go of some other things that you might also need to do or want to do, right? And I think that that is the big thing. And you've got to kind of figure out, okay, what do I want more? You know, you have to decide based on what is, what do you value the most? What it is that you want the most? For your life sometimes you know like to think that oh i'll wait until you know i do this before i do that before i do whatever it's like well you know what you might be dead tomorrow so you might as well like just get on with it now so i don't know it's like you know i'm, I'm not very inspiring when it comes to these things but um yeah you can absolutely do whatever it is that you decide that you want to do let's put it this way i decided in 2000 and whatever 2000 2017, I decided to become a weightlifter amidst all of these things, you know, and Alma, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, right? So I actually train like a professional bodybuilder at the same time that I'm doing all of these things. So is it possible to do it? Absolutely. It's whatever you choose that you want to do that's going to determine what you actually end up doing, okay? Uh, do you, no worries. Do you think that it's a good question? Sorry. Yes, go for it. Well, another another um, participant is, is asking right now. I'm a general physician, and I pretend to do the USMLE to apply for the match. We and um, would like to be an uh, OV. Do you recommend first the residency and then the MPH? And loving the PPCR course itself and the research too. 
So what was the last bit of the question? Do you recommend to do the residency first or the MPH first? Right, okay. I, I recommend that you choose. <laughs> that is my recommendation. And here's why. You see, the truth is that you already know the answer to that question, right? You already know, you know your capabilities, you know your weaknesses, you know your strengths. I, and nobody else in your life will know that about you. Not even the person who knows the most about you in your life, right? The truth is that that is such a personal determination within your being that, you know, it, it, nobody can answer that for you. I mean, there are different circumstances that people find themselves in and there, there are different opportunities. Like when I actually was thinking of, you know, my own journey of, okay, I've got, I, I manage 40 staff, right? I have a very busy life. I do many things. And one of the things that I was thinking is, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice to be able to not have all of these responsibilities so that I can actually focus on my studies? Well, it was not possible. You know, it was never going to happen. It was not reasonable or viable. Uh, it would have been nice in my dreams, but, you know, it was a point in my life where I just needed to just get in there, get in deep, focus, get it done. It's like waxing, you know, ladies, full body waxing. It's like waxing. It's horrible. But it, when it's done, it's done. Do you, know, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Right? It's, it, it, that's just how it is. It's not pleasant, but it has to be done. And you just get in there and you just do it because you don't want to like, imagine, you don't want to apply the wax and then like, you know, gently try and peel it off. Do you want to do that? No, 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 no. Just get it off. Just get it done. And yeah, see, everyone in the chat is going, amen. Right? Absolutely. Like waxing, just get it done. So uh, how did you choose your MPH subjects? Very good question. I chose my MPH subjects based on my interests. So, it, you know, there are some elective subjects and there are some subjects that you have to do. There are core subjects. So everybody has to do epidemiology. Everybody has to do biostatistics. And it's a lot of epidemiology and a lot of biostatistics because that's what an MPH is, right? So you've got to do all of those things. But then within it, there are different places and different things that you can actually choose. And so the choices that I made in terms of other elective subjects were based on things that I wanted to develop further. So for example, in my first year, I actually had an amazing professor, Dr. Masha Testa, who basically validates um, surveys. And, you know, that was one of class that I took. And then I took another class that was related to surveys because that's one area, given the amount of people that we have on our, in our community and our database, survey-based research is something that we can very easily perform. So that's really how I kind of looked. I, I said, okay, well, given my resources, given where I am and the things that I can do, what are some things that are going to actually be useful for where I am right now and where I want to be. And that's essentially how I made those decisions of which subjects to choose, all based on interests. Now, there was another question. Do you think it's reasonable to do an MPH maintaining a full-time job? Well, I think I answered that question in saying that, you know, I, I have done that and it is a challenge, I won't lie. Um, it requires a lot of organization, especially if you have a family, but it's absolutely possible. And in fact, the vast majority of people who are in, in my program, they are in a similar situation, right? So yes, it's absolutely possible. Oh, I love this question. What are some strategies that you utilize when you question your gut? That is such a good question. Such a good question. And the one strategy that I use is I ask myself the question and then I notice, how does it make me feel? You know, if it makes me feel like a little bit like, oh, that's a little bit exciting. Oh, that's that, that, that gives me energy. And actually, that's a good, that's a really good way of, of putting it. If I think about something and it gives me energy and it makes me feel like, oh, yeah, that feels good, that seems good, that sounds good. Then I, I check in, there's three questions I ask. Is it good for me? Is it good for others? Is it good for the long-term? 
those are my three questions. I'll ask those three questions in any decision that I make. Right. So if I ask those three questions after kind of checking in and feeling like, oh, yeah, okay, that feels that feels right. I'll ask those three questions. If the answer is yes, then I just go for it. Right. If the answer is no, then I deliberate a little bit more Then I think about it. Then I, you know, kind of check in and recheck in. But typically and this is the truth and you guys will know this, too. The first answer is the right answer. We might want to talk ourselves out of probably everything. <laughs> that we can, that we think is scary or that's not going to work out the way that we want it or that it's going to cost more than we are willing to pay, right? But the reality is that the first answer is the right answer and you know, you just know. You know, I spoke to someone yesterday, to a prospective patient yesterday, and it was really interesting and I had to call her out on this because I talked to her, I explained to her what I saw in her case, I explained to her how we could help. She basically... At the end of the conversation was really like, yeah, this is this this sounds like what I need and what I want. And then every single time that she would go, yes, this is what I want, she would backtrack and second guess herself. But what if, you know, this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen? I'm like, at one point, I literally said, listen, listen now. <laughs> you are trying to talk yourself out of doing things that you know are going to be good for you. For as long as you wish to stay there. I can't help you. So let's just end this conversation. Call me whenever, right? And at that point, she was really shocked because she was like, but no, you know, this is, this is what I said. Listen, if this is really what you want, then you need to make a decision. And that decision can't be you second guessing everything that you know is going to be right for your future. Because if you do that, nobody can help you. And that applies to every aspect of life, right? So just don't second guess yourself. That's the big, that's the big takeaway. Uh, what are the questions? Oh, can I repeat the three questions? Is it good for me? Is it good for others? Is it good for the long term? Those are the three questions. If you have yes to those three questions, go for it. Okay, what are the, are there any other questions that you guys have for me? Let me just see if I've missed anything. Alma, do you see anything else? Yes, they're also asking if um, how important is research, research background for the MPH application? Look, the research background is actually a really great question because I have not yet published, other than my uh, PPCR protocol, scientifically, I haven't yet published very much, right? In fact, other than my books, um, you know, I haven't actually published, and my, and my PPCR protocol that we published in the PPCR journal, I haven't published very much, but the reality is that that's not exactly what they're looking for. Public health is about public health. And if you can demonstrate that your interest is in furthering public health in whatever context that you find yourself in, that is really what they want to see, right? And so I don't believe, um, certainly if it was a necessity and a very high, people that are doing an MPH typically, and this was the experience that I had with all of my colleagues, some had already published, some had published a lot, some had published a little, um, but all of them were wanting to improve and better their process and their scientific knowledge and their ability of actually conducting good quality research. So it's about learning. You know, you don't go to a gym because you are already strong. You go to a gym because you want to get strong or, and so, you know, or stronger. And so that's essentially, you know, what you need to think about. Ah. Thank you, Michelle Menon. Uh, you are so sweet. Um, so yeah, research background, I think it's, what do I do with the kids? <laughs> I have an army. <laughs> I have an army of help, let me tell you. Um, between, yeah, it's, it's very, very important to be able to, to do that. Uh, let's see, what else is there? Can you comment about the difference between the MPH and the Master of Science? Can I comment on the difference? Yes, yes, I can. Well, I actually did a Master of Science before I did an MPH. So my Master's of Science in Medicine was done in, at Sydney University. And they, in, at, at Harvard, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is, although I do know that some of the people in the Master of Science program at Harvard, they also do some biostatistics and epidemiology, but different universities around the world and different curricula around the world will be different. 
I know for a fact that when, when I did mine, they're very different. One is very much more focused on research, epidemiology, biostatistics for the MPH. And the Master of Science also has some of that component. And, you know, again, the curriculum at Harvard, I haven't actually looked at. I think that it's very similar in, in many ways. But I believe that the Master of Science is 60 credits as opposed to the MPH, which is 45 credits. So you actually have to do more in the Master of Science at Harvard. But I ended up doing the nutrition concentration, which is an extra nine credits. So, you know, it ended up being very similar. For just so that you guys know, there are different types of concentrations that you can get in. So in, in, at Harvard, there might be, let's say, for example, there's the maternal uh, maternal and, and fetal health department, for example, and they have a concentration that they run. So you actually do extra subjects that are related to that particular department and to that particular topic. So you might also want to look out, if you do apply for your MPH, you might want to look out for different types of um, concentrations that you might want to be interested in applying for. It's something that you have to apply for and get accepted for extra on top of your MPH, but it's definitely a really great experience because, for example, had I not actually got into the Department of Nutrition's um, concentration, I wouldn't have done um, I wouldn't have done nutritional epidemiology. And looking back now, it has really been such an amazing, amazing experience and um, something that really will make a big difference to my future career. So looking into the concentrations that you can get into once you are in the actual program is definitely going to be helpful. But it's also just a matter of actually looking on the website. If you go onto the, onto the Harvard website, they've got the differences between the MPH 45, the MPH 60, the Master of Science degree, and you know, a few other offerings that they have in the, in the different programs. So you might just want to go onto the website and check it out. Yeah, There's there another question here. Huh? Oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 you go, go ahead, Amon. Oh, it's because um, and I got another private question about how they're busy they are um, on the regular job. So other option is that you can take the summer program, like the MPH just during the summer, and you might have it done in three years instead of having it in one year or one year and a half. It might depend on the circumstances, but you can take it just the summer program. So you take just those 10 weeks fully on the, on the MPH, and then the rest of the year is different. At least that's there. right. Yeah. So, so basically, that's actually the program that I got into, except that because of COVID, what ended up happening was um, we, and that is what Alma said is exactly right. So the summer program, you go in for three summers and you complete all of your subjects in three summers. You have the option of doing an extra up to five credits in the fall. Uh, as a part of, you know, like online as a part of your program, if you do it that way. The benefits of doing it that way is that, again, you need kind of like, you know, it's six weeks, let's say eight weeks, because by the time you get to Boston and by the time you get back home, let's say eight weeks for three summers to be able to actually complete it. But you also need to, um, you, you also need to understand that your practicum project you will actually be doing and, you know, kind of working on outside of those times. So that definitely means that you would need to take at least the six weeks to six to eight weeks of summer off from work, because that I would not recommend trying to work and do summer school at the same time, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually took sabbatical for every one of my six weeks because it was not very pleasant at all to try and do everything at the same time. So that I would recommend. But then um, the, the one year or, you know, say year and a half program, you actually, and you can also do it part time, by the way. So you don't, if you were in Boston, you actually can do it part time. The other thing that you need to take into consideration is that if you live in Boston, you can do certain classes and certain subjects that you would not otherwise be able to do if you are a summer only program uh, student. Now, I was really lucky because some of the subjects that I wanted to take were falling into that category of, of subjects that I could not take being a summer only student, but because of COVID, they actually opened the entire university for all of the courses that you wanted to do, which again, can you see, had I, and I was really stretched at the time, 
I was thinking like, oh my God, am I going to be able to fit in all of these extra subjects? But then I realized one thing I said, if I don't do it now, next year or the year after or ever again, I will never be able to do it because they, that's just a, a requirement of those subjects that you have to be a, pre, a, pre, a student present in the university um, for those classes. So I'm like, okay, you know what? Just bite the bullet, do it now. And it was the best thing that I did. You know, some of the networking opportunities and contacts that I gained in two of the classes that I did that I would have not have been able to do have really set me just, you know, amazingly in my future career as a result. So sometimes you just got to hustle, hustle, hustle. There is another question here. Um, as a medical student, I always feel I'm behind others and I'm not doing enough and leads to self-doubt, to a lot of doubt and low confidence. It's a vicious cycle. As someone who has achieved so much in her life, have you ever had this doubt? Oh, I won't say your name, but you know who you are. And here's what I will say to you. The reality is that no person in the universe is all confidence. Okay, we all have our low times, our down times, our doubtful times, our horrendous times. We all have times and situations in our lives where we feel completely out of control. We feel that nothing that we do is ever going to matter. And that, you know, ultimately, what is the point of it all anyway? Let me tell you one thing from personal experience. This too shall pass. Okay, and that is the thing that you need to remember is that, you know, it's okay to have low days, it's okay to have low months, it's okay to have low years. But what you need to know is that you are absolutely good enough, you would not be where you are right now in your life, if that wasn't true. That's the first thing. The second thing, remember, you don't have the desire for no reason. It's there for a reason. It's there because you can do it. Full stop, all right? So just think of that. And when you feel low and when you feel down, you just look back at what you have already achieved. You have already achieved so much. And you know that, and I don't need to tell you that, right? So the key is that you need to start to believe that. You need to start to understand that, you know, only you can give yourself the validation that you want. Nobody is going, like, you know, honestly, I am super confident and I like go and do the things that I want to do. And still there are times that I actually question, oh my God, is that good enough? You know? And the truth is that no amount of other people telling me, like, honestly, if I was to tell you the number of times in my week, in my week, in fact, the number of times in my day, that people come to me and say, oh my God, you're so inspiring. Thank you, it's lovely, right? But I tell you what, it really does zero to me. <laughs> and here's why, because it does not matter what other people think of me more than what I think of me. So if I don't feel that I am inspiring, if I don't feel that I'm making a difference, if I don't feel whatever it is that people are telling me, guess what? Goes in one ear, out the other. Right. So here's the key is that you need to start to believe that you are enough, that you are worthy and that you are exactly where you need to be in your world right now. Once you start to understand that and believe that and truly internalize that, you don't need other people's validations. And you know what's greatest is that their criticism is also going to go in one ear out the other. And I can tell you one thing from having dealt with hundreds of thousands of people around the world, there will be plenty of criticism, right? And if you start to buy into that, your life is over before it starts. So don't, okay? Just know you're enough. Keep reminding yourself, that's the key. So that's my advice to you. Gabriela, I got another private question and they said, oh, I reviewed Gabriela's CV and she's really impressive. Of course she got into Harvard. How can I do that? What to do to, to uh, make my, my CV stronger? <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, but you see, again, we come to that point of comparison. Comparison is not good for anybody, right? And when it comes to this type of situation, a lot of people, they don't 
try. They don't brave. They don't move forward, not because they're not capable, but because they think that why should I even try because other people are going to be better than me, you know? Like it is the biggest fallacy of human nature, that, okay? Because you see, the vast majority of people never actually create what they envision in their life, not because they're not capable. Please, I want us to go back to this slide right here. They don't achieve the things that they want to achieve. They don't create what they envision in their mind, not because they are not capable, not because they don't have the desire, but because they second guess themselves, right? So here's the thing. My resume, really, if I was, if I was really to compare <laughs> my resume with other resumes of my colleagues at Harvard, right, I don't think there is a comparison. Like, I think that I would absolutely be at the bottom of the barrel. But you know what? It doesn't matter because you know what? At the end of the day, it's what you do with that. You see, no other person in the world has the same kind of type of energy and drive and ambition and whatever else that I personally have, right? Nobody has the same kind of drive and ambition and desire that you personally have. So every person is unique in what drives them and what makes them shine, right? And so as long as you stick, I, I call this swimming in my lane. Right, oh, yes, and, this is, oh, and that is a really, really important thing is that whenever people tell me, oh, you're amazing, I just go, you know what? Keep swimming in your lane. Don't take it personally because nothing that anybody ever says is because of you, okay, good or bad. So I don't actually look at my resume and think, oh, my God, it's amazing. That's why I got into Harvard. No, I look at it and say, hey, you know what? I was determined to do whatever it is that I needed to do to get into Harvard. And that is why I got into Harvard. It was because I was pestering every person that I could, including Felipe. Sorry, Felipe, but it's true. He knows. Um, you know, I was pestering every person I could to go, okay, what else? How else? What, you know, like who else, <laughs> right? Do I need to reach out to, connect, ask questions from, and whatever it is that needed to be done for me to actually get this done. I was pestering Alma, Alma, where's Felipe's letter? Alma, what, what am I going to do here? You know, it's like the reality is that it wasn't because if I had not done the things that I needed to do, if I had not actually pestered enough, you know, I went to, to um, Donald I said, Donald, help me with this letter of intent, you know, like, and he was like, oh, you know, I'll see. But he did. He was so, so sweet. And, um, you know, so there's all of these things that you actually need to just like, you need to kind of get in there, dog with a bone, get it done. And that is how you get into Harvard. That's how you get into anything that you ever want to get into. It's basically by being determined and deciding that that's what you're going to do. The rest is the how. And the how really doesn't matter because it's like next step, next step, next step, next step until. And actually, I would say that, yes, and I would say that that is the distinguishing factor between me and many other people out there. It's not that I'm special. It's not. Trust me. I failed my like, you know, HSC, whatever. Like, like I've, I've never been like the most amazing student at, at school or, you know, I had a very varied upbringing in terms of like, I moved to Australia when I was 13. Then I went back to, I went to Germany as an exchange student. So I studied there for a year, then went back to Brazil, then went back to Australia. So my, my schooling was really kind of, you know, all over the place. So I actually had to really decide and pick and focus on what it is that I really wanted. And I realized very early on that as long as I did that, then everything else would actually fall into place. So that is how you do it. Any other questions? Yes, one, uh, one from Leticia, she asked you to give her time management tips. Time management tips. I say time management tips are very, very easy. <laughs> and it's this. What are all the things that you're going to start saying no to that you can say no to? So I... 
very interesting because I remember there is one, um, one person in my life, he is a super accomplished personal development um, guy that you know, I connect with from time to time. And I remember once him saying to me, he said, Gabriella, there's only three things I do in my life. I travel, I teach, and I, what is it, the, the third thing? I forget what the third thing is. Oh, research, that's right. I travel, I teach, I research. Those are the three things. And quite, quite seriously, like he does not drive, he does not cook, he does not clean, he does not like, he, nothing else in his life take, gets any of his attention. Right. And at the very first time that I heard that, I thought, oh, my God, but how do you how do you even do that? Like, how can you even do that? And if you look at his life and how his life is and what it demonstrates, you can see that all he does is teach research and, you know, whatever the other thing I said is like, you know, learn, whatever. But the reality is that when he said that to me, I was like, okay, how can I do that? What is it that I value enough that I can absolutely say that I am going to focus my attention on? And I did my, my, my values process to figure out, okay, well, what are the things in my life that, what does my life demonstrate and how do I want to be spending my time? And once I realized that for me, there were very specific things that I wanted to do and very specific things that I did not want to do, I figured out how I could actually work out in other areas of my life the things that I could either pay someone to delegate to someone or simply just not do to be able to carve out the time for the things that I did want to do you know so for me for example training is an absolute like you will get me in the gym when COVID hit I literally set up a commercial gym in my home like it is just absolutely what happened, right? And so you you'll see that I will be there every single day that I need to be there, and for as long as it is that it takes for me to be there. So I ha I have arranged my life in such ways that that actually happens. I don't watch TV, like not even a little bit. So the fact that I own a TV is like it just sits there. But these are the types of things that you need to actually understand. Because like I said before, there's a cost for everything, right? So there's a cost to watching TV. Sure, there's a cost to not watching TV. But there's a cost to watching TV. So if some people are spending five hours in front of the TV a night thinking that they wanted to do all of these other things in their life, if they actually even decrease that to an hour a night instead of five, You've got an extra four hours that you can be doing whatever it is that you want to do. Also, I usually get up between four and five o'clock in the morning, right? And I go to bed at about 8.30 at night. So that way I know that my priorities are making sure that I get enough sleep. And I do that because by the time it you know, gets to 7.30, 8 o'clock, I definitely need to go to sleep. But I also need to go to sleep because I know the next day I'm going to be getting up the train. So these are the types of things that you actually need to self-inquire and go, okay, well, how am I going to actually organize my schedule and my life to fit the things that I absolutely want to do that are my top priorities and that I want to get done? For example, in writing my fifth book right now, one of the ways that I actually use, I have this little thing called a daily agreement. And a daily agreement for me works in such a way that I actually focus on the thing that I want to get done in that day, no matter what. And I make it really tiny. So for example, this book that I'm writing, I have made a daily agreement with myself that I will write five minutes every single day for at least five minutes for seven days a week. So it happens every single day. Some days what happens is as I start writing for my five minutes. And by the way, I would say that probably six out of seven days in the week, I don't want to sit down for my five minutes of writing, right? But I do. And so what happens is I sit down and I start writing and, you know, I do my five minutes. Some days I keep it at five minutes. Some days like four minutes, 30 seconds feels like an eternity, right? But some days I'm still writing three hours later. So the key aspect is to kind of figure out what games you can play with yourself that are going to actually help you further your objective. That's the key. If you can start to understand what your psychology, how things actually move you, then you start to unlock the opportunities and the possibilities for you to do even more, 
right? So figuring out what it is that you're not going to do is the number, like literally writing down a list and removing those things from your schedule are going to dramatically free up an amount of time that you didn't even know you realized, that you didn't even realize you had, right? And then figuring out what it is that you absolutely want to insert in there, starting with a five minute agreement if you have to. And we actually do this as a clinic, you know, all of my staff, we have a daily agreement channel that we all go in there, we decide on a daily agreement. Some people decide on five minutes of exercise a day. Some people decide on having a salad every day. Some people decide like, you know, whatever it is, but it has to be something personal that they want to prioritize. And so that's what you do. You just kind of focus on what is that one thing and you, that one thing. And, you know, one thing I know is that because I've done, I've written books like this before. <laughs> and so I know that five minutes, it might not sound very, like very much, but it's amazing how much you can actually get done in five minutes. So that's one of my tips. So I hope that helps. And I'm happy to answer any more questions if there are any, but uh, I also know that we are over time, Alma. So whatever you guys want. So there are no more questions here. Um, I don't think I have any more either. Let me just see. Any other final question or please feel free to open your mic. I think that I don't have any more either. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers all of the things that we wanted to talk about. Feel free to reach out. You know, I'm more than happy to um, answer any questions after this as well. If you do follow me on uh, social media, just let me know that you have actually participated or listened to this talk because sometimes I might not actually accept, particularly on Facebook because it's a little bit difficult. But um, if you let me know that it's you, that you've listened to this talk, then by all means, love to connect. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I hope that helps and supports you. And more than anything, just remember, you wouldn't have the desire if you weren't capable of its achievement. I think that's the key message. Great, Gabriela. Thank you so much for your time. And um, we know that it's already morning in Sydney and that you have a lot of stuff to do. We appreciate your, um, your, all your input, your, your tips, and uh, for having us today. So thank you. Thank you. you no, know, it's such an amazing, amazing opportunity. And I know that you guys are all going to do great. So keep up the good work. Make sure you do your group projects nicely, people. Right. In fact, actually, group projects, I have to say, some of my absolute best friends in my life right now have come out of our group project at PPCR. So I am so grateful for that opportunity as well. So um, in terms of my social media, so the people are asking here, I'm doing um, Gabriella Rosa underscore strong is probably the one that I actually personally am on Instagram is the one that I'm personally more. And yes, I'm also on LinkedIn. So, in fact, here, if you guys want to connect, why don't you screenshot this? This um, QR code here will take you to all of the different social media. Except for personally, Gabriella Rosa Strong is the one that, if you wanted to connect personally, that's the one that I would recommend because that's the one that I actually manage. Everything else is managed by my team. I can also all right, see guys. that. <laughs> so you don't have to yeah yeah no worries all right darling thank you so much guys thank you i really appreciate your time and i really wish you all of the very best on your journey to your career thank you see everyone you have a nice night nice morning for you gabriela and uh, we will see you this thursday in the lecture tomorrow bye bye see you guys bye for now <laughs>